<clears throat> Good morning. I'm. Uh, this is a reflections video on yesterday's uh, playtest of Dark Age of Man. Uh, I have watched back pieces of the um, actual play. One of the reasons I'd love to record the sessions is we can learn from our sessions, right? We can learn from other people. We can learn. We can see our, you know, our bad habits, etc. Um, so Dell and I had an incredible conversation, which we did indeed post. Uh, the conversation was a dialogue of us uh, discussing and working out again the next phase of, of where we're going with our Dark Age of Man, and uh, we decided to publish that. Uh, I thought, well, I decided, I, I asked Del if he was okay with me publishing it, um, and he agreed because I think it was an interesting conversation uh, between two guys trying to develop or understand you know, what, we, what it is we want to create. And in that, Dell made some great points about my, um, I won't say it's a bad habit because he certainly didn't call it that, but I think it is uh, in my history of D20 uh, and the nature of how I've DM'd my whole life, I tend to complete the narrative uh, thoughts. I tend to complete what happened, and I think most GMs do this because players roll the dice and then they want to hear what that means, right? Uh, so in D&D and &D, in D20, that's just a very popular way of explaining, uh, and I mean all, I think almost all G DMs from D&D &D do this, right? They roll a uh, they roll a die and then DM says, oh yeah, you know, you jumped the pit, you balanced on the edge, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just the only guy that does that. And I think some players like that. They expect that. But in our game, the goal is to empower the players to tell us. Uh, it's almost like you want to turn all the players into GMs, right, at the table. And so yesterday I thought was a fantastic session. Fantastic. I think the system is truly intuitive. Very, very simple for people to do. I mean, it, it quite literally is... Um, Declare what you're trying to achieve. <clears throat> Activate something. The GM will tell you whether yes and roll, right? Um, so really, the, the GM's role is to call on the roll if it's if it's necessary. And I noticed in the combat, which was one of the, the, the best combats we've had in our playtests, uh, uh, we had a great, great combat in our local session uh, a few weeks ago. Um... Uh, but it was a mob. It was a mob type combat as opposed to one on one. Uh, lots of combatants one on one, and that's what happened yesterday. And um, uh, there's only one thing there I would like to have fixed uh, f myself, and that was my bad habit. For instance, Kevin, uh, these guys take charge, and they're doing exactly what Dell and I want players to do. You know, say I'm 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 picking up the pole, I'm swinging the pole around, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drive it into the chest of this rider. And, Try to knock him off his horse, and they and I say roll the dice. It's a it's a difficult chance or whatever. And they roll the dice, boom, they do it. And the goal is for me to step out of the way and let them narrate. Yes, you did it. Let them say, okay, I, that pole lifts him off the horse, I, and I kind of drop him down on the ground, you know, knocking the wind out of him, and then we go to the next turn. But instead, I tended to tell the end of that tale. So one of the goals of our game is players declare action through their narrative of what they're doing. And then if that requires a role, or if there's a, ch a direct conflict or challenge, the GM calls for a role. And that role is going to involve the appropriate attribute. Uh, again, another brilliant... Uh, the, the other thing I, I loved about the play uh, test was it was proving what Dell and I have been trying to talk about with the gaming. There is no procedural turn-based kind of you go, I go. Um, it's 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 all kind of simultaneous. Things are occurring, and players are free because this is chaos. Players are free to subtly fold in their next action. And there was this amazing moment, and I don't know what the timestamp is on the actual play, but in the middle of this foray, Kevin has already uh, dis uh, deceded this uh, this horseman with his pole and knocked him onto the ground, and as we're we're kind of as we're spinning through the combat to the next combatant, uh, 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 Kevin folds into that. Uh, uh, basically, is is this horse headed toward my friend Axton? And that to me is a cue that he is 
in a way, while doing this, he is sending silent prayers to his God because he is a friar and, he's, and he is a devout man. And this subtle way we can blend the powers of magic into the game. And uh, it, it allows the players seamless control of the events, right? As opposed to the GM saying, no, next turn you can do that. Or, right? or no, it's not your turn, Kevin, right? So he just seamlessly makes a prayer. It's like a subtle prayer. Uh, that the horse go toward his friend Axton, and I say, make a roll, dude, it's a, and he bangs out a 17, and I finish it, yes, the horse kind of trots over and sashays very close to Axton in this, this fight, and then Axton is free with an advantage, and I give him an advantage, I don't tell him that, but he gets an advantage, because there's a prayer involved here, it's almost like this, it, it's almost like a, it's a, it, it's, a, Kevin spent part of his turn helping his friend, so that's like a boost, and then Axton with the die roll is up and on the horse, right? Now, the only complaint I had about that entire piece of the session, which I thought was brilliant, and the guys get it. I mean, these guys, it's it, I think it's intuitive. I think players are still worried about taking too much agency over the narration, and they're too they don't want to they don't want to declare something that isn't true. Because we have been taught our whole lives, whoa, whoa, whoa don't uh, don't make those assumptions, right? Well, in our game, we're kind of trying to tell the players. They're not assumptions. Your vision of what's happening is as valid as the GM's vision of what's happening. So I'm still a player, and so I'm doing the same thing, right? I win, they lose the role, I get to take charge, right? I get to say, okay, he, he chops you with his, his weapon and is circling you, and, and, and uh, Axton says, I'm running for the horse, and he breaks the roll, and he makes it so he's up on the horse, and I, I just describe how he misses you at the last second as you run up and jump on the horse. It, I, we want it to be this fast foray of shared hot potato narrative. Uh, my only complaint in the in the uh, my reflections on this is that I very often finished their successful roles, and that's something that's just uh, it's going to be a habit of mine. I have got to break. So Kevin, when he was successful, I should have said, "Tell me what that looks like." Right? I got to learn to say if because if Kevin doesn't naturally tell me how that happens. I have to prompt him to please tell us how that happened so we know where he's at. We have to know where this enemy is on the battlefield now. So when you dc him, what's that look like? So we all then can visually see him hit the ground and roll away, right? Um, and so in a way, when the player declares and we roll the dice to find out who wins that, that narrative action, whoever wins or loses gets to narrate the next piece of that. So I have to learn to step aside and cue them, please tell us how that looks, please tell us how that happens. I've got to learn to do that instead of just doing it for them. And so that's my biggest complaint in watching back our game. Um, because our game in many ways then looked, it looked traditional, when in reality it's not, it's just not going to be that way. The ebb and flow of, of negotiation, the ebb and flow of uh, navigating the river, the ebb and flow of combat, the ebb and flow of 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 uh, uh, picking locks or all of that needs to be seamless conversation in which the player says I'm I'm going to step forward I'm going to inspect I'm, gonna, I'm inspecting the lock and I'm going to start picking this lock it's it's almost we want it to be in the present tense active narration right not can I go up and look at the lock and pick the lock uh, it is I'm investigating the lock uh, what's this look like to to me and then the GM says well the lock is it's an incredibly sophisticated lock. And then he goes on to say, well, uh, I'm breaking out my tools. I'm getting to work on this lock, right? And the GM can say, okay, uh, it's fairly sophisticated. It's going to take you a long time. It's a, it's, a, it's going to be a very, very nigh impossible lock pick for you. And then they go about rolling the die, and then they fail. And then he says, you know, the GM will say, you know, it's after after 45 minutes, you're, it's, you're frustrated by this. And unfortunately, you can't trigger the mechanism, right? Or if it's successful prompt them to say, tell us. And, uh, you know, the GM can say it takes you 20 minutes to, and then they tell you how they successfully trick this lock, right? Trip this lock. So the only thing, and again, remember, we're all, in a way, have to learn new habits, and we have to unlearn old habits that have been, that have been, that have been the, uh, not just from years of playing a particular way, but from years of playing a particular system, right? A particular, th when people tell me, and, we, and again, I agree with this, we've had these conversations ad infinitum in many of these groups on Facebook and many of these private conversations about system matters. The system indeed does matter. And in this sense, our system is meant to be 
solely almost invisible. The system is meant to be utterly invisible. It's a single die check based on the difficulty. And your character's modifiers are the only modifiers that will ever come up in play. The GM can shift the difficulty of the challenge up or down the, the sliding scale as opposed to giving plus ones and plus twos, etc. Right? So the players get to add a plus number to the die roll from their gear and their, their, their abilities. But the GM just subtly shifts the difficulty, which is a which is, is uh, a term, not a number, so it's hard or nigh impossible. Or, right? So we're trying to get away from mechanical conversation. We want the players to be uh, characters in the world live, and we want them uh, uh, in present tense narration activating, maybe activating dice checks, right? As opposed to asking, as opposed to past tense, as opposed to this is what I'd like to do. And of course, that takes time, right? Because Think about it. Uh, we, I don't. I've never known a game where you play like this, right? Almost every game has procedure, a procedure in which the GM is ultimately still in control of everything. I am. Uh, I am still, in a way, the one who's presenting the truth of the initial setup. There are six horsemen riding on you. They'll be here in one turn, right? That's that's enough for them to know they're going to face six dangerous combatants, right, on horseback. Now, how they go about saying they're going to shoot bows or set up or run through the woods and look for cover, whatever they want to do, that triggers the role or the next phase of narration. Todd says, I'm running through the woods looking for cover. He rolls mine. He fails. I say the horses are right. The two horsemen are right on your heels, right? Uh, next, we go over to the knight. The knight's leaping off the boat and giving orders to Jack and the boy. Don't, don't, don't you leave that boat and preparing for the other horsemen. And, you know, we're boom, we crash into this foray. And then we want it to be this conversational, uh, in-character declaration of what you're doing. And when you win the role, you continue to go when you lose the role. So again, in our game, a role is guaranteed pass-fail, right? Either critical success, critical failure, but you will pass or fail. Uh, pass-fail determines whether you suffer or they suffer, etc. There are no stalemates, there are no freebies, so combat is incredibly dangerous. As they found out, we had two combatants die in our first combat yesterday. As uh, when you fill those roles, you're going to suffer wounds. When you engage in a violent confrontation with another thing, there is no breath of air, right? You're either going to be causing their demise, or they're going to be causing your demise. And if you lose more of those roles than you win and you can't find a way out of that combat or to defend yourself or to or to or to give up. I mean, Axton could have he could have surrendered to the uh, mercenaries. Um remember, he could have he could have said I want all of my actions to be defensive. I'm pulling my shield up with both hands and I'm blocking everything until until the knight can come help me. And then all of his roles, I would have made those roles easier to avoid wounds, right? I would have said, "Okay, you're now in a fair combat because these guys are average." They would have been now at a fair combatant, and all of those would have not been wounds on that other guy. He couldn't have wounded him, but he would have avoided all wounds. And um, it, the, the, because those aren't hard and fast rules, and the players don't know that, they're, they're limited right now by what they think they're allowed to do versus telling me what they want to do, right? I do not want to get hit by this swordsman, and I have a shield. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to block everything this guy throws at me. And that cues me as to what he wants to do. And when he says, I am, I do not want to let this guy hit me with his sword, and i got both hands on my shield, and I'm fighting like hell to not let this guy get to me. If you've ever been in a fight, it's capable. You're capable of that kind of defensive posture, right? So um, it's not easy, especially with a guy with a, a long sword, right? With a hand and a half a long sword, or whatever, broadsword, whatever the hell they call those. But the, the point is, he could have cued that this was about not getting wounded until help could arrive. Uh, but again, he didn't know that. Todd didn't know that. But that's part of our goal of our game, too, is to recognize we want players to have utter agency. We want them to tell us what the hell they're doing, what they're trying to do. Not, not, not can I do this and how do I achieve it? Not, I think I want to make this, uh, you know, just... You know, I'm defending myself. I, I, I'm not going to let this guy wound me right now if I can, if, you know, unless he gets a lucky, lucky shot, right? Um, and so that's going to come because we've never, uh, none of us have ever played a game quite like ours, right? Um, so the system is really meant to, to put both GM and player in the role of naive. It's meant to put the GM and the player in role of player. So we're all playing. And it's meant, it's meant to um, empower the players that they're, 
narration and their vision of what it scene looks like is as legitimate as the GM's. So when Kevin says he de-seats this guy with a pole and, and kind of balances him at the end of the pole and then drops him on his head, that's legit. It counts. It's a wound. Boom. Dude took a wound. It doesn't matter whether the wound was in the chest or when he dropped him on his head. He... Kevin won that combat, that, that turn of combat. Therefore, that guy's wounded. How Kevin wants to de describe how that wound occurs is entirely up to Kevin. And now we know this guy's been dropped on his head. Now, I might describe that he gets up kind of dizzy and stumbling around, but we're still in combat, and now he's coming at you with his short sword. But we're still in combat. He has not killed the guy. Um, and so there was another great moment where Kevin said, my intention is to knock him out. I don't want to kill. I'm not a killer. I want to, I want to, I want to knock him from battle. I want to knock him unconscious. And I gave him a choice because, again, they don't know the rules. I gave him a choice. You can just roll and accept that if you roll a 20, it's an automatic knockout and you'll knock the guy unconscious. Or I can increase the difficulty as you try to target, like, the back of his skull purposely to, like, pop, knock him out. And uh, it's a harder roll, but you'll actually, have a, you'll actually have more opportunities for that to occur, but it's going to be harder to hit him initially. And he took that choice, which was smart because 20 is a 5% chance. Knocking him up from an average to a hard, he still had like a 30% chance. So it was, a, it was a very smart choice there, right? And again, because he's not trying to kill that opponent, and he just wants to even the odds and knock him unconscious, I'm not going to punish the player for wanting to achieve that, right? Um, and so when people say our game would lack tactics because it doesn't have these layers of procedures, Kevin in one fight used multiple tactics. Right, he he unseated the guy. He then oh, then he went for the knockout blow versus the killing blow. He then used his magic to steer the horse toward his friend. Kevin was incredibly dynamic and tactical through that entire fight as a harmless friar, basically, right? As a, as a friar that's carrying a crappy old dagger, right, and, and and rags and rags, a peasant friar. And it was it was it was fantastic. It was it was classic literature, right? Friar Tuck, right? So. Um, this is our goal, right? Now, my complaint had nothing to do with my players. It was me. I was So the game started a bit awkward in that I had tried a couple of new things in the random seed generator that were a big gamble that I had never done before, which was involve information that could occur in a random role that would instantly be imparted onto a player without previous knowledge, okay, if I can make that understood. So, for instance, our random seed generator is always events in the world, right? They're usually a, an incomplete sentence. It's, you have to, you want it to be vague enough that it makes the GM think, what the hell does this mean? What's the context of this? So, the, the GM is playing, and there's a very little prep, and you can't, and you want it vague enough that you could squeeze it into whatever's occurring in the world, right, in context. So, it needs to be just vague enough that we can, we can find a way to fold it into what's occurring in the game session. Okay. Well, I actually put three different types of terms or different types of things and they were all PCs would have some information or a thing on their possession that had further ramifications for some other event that could occur in the session. For instance, they were this was set up in media res, they were traveling to meet King Edmund to barter to get siege weapons for their lead, their lord. Um, so we knew that they were on trek to London, and we knew that this was the goal of the session, was to try to meet with the king and get these weapons. So I wrote some random seats that if indeed they're in front of the king or the bishop, they would present the king with a codicil that's sealed, that, that would say something that they're not aware of, right? Um, well, they don't know that going into session, so when I randomly roll that, and then out of the blue I say to, uh, I say to Dell, the codicil that you were given by your lord to take to the king is not on your person. It's floating in the river in, a, in saddlebags where it fell off your horse, you know. And it, he's, you know, you, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing to, to drop on a player live in session when he's like, what codicil? What are you talking about? But, but that's the goal of the game too, right, is the random seeds force the GM to think, okay, you know, this is part of my play. This is where I get to play. How am I going to introduce this thing effectively, narratively, in play to Dell without Dell being confused or without Dell? And it was beautiful. Dell said, I need to get, I need to fish those saddlebags out of the river. Into the boats, man. I got to get my saddlebags. It was perfect. Dell just, Dell instantly knew this is information now that is utterly relevant to the session. Uh, and it was introduced via a random seed roll, right? So it was very cool. But I felt very awkward about it when I rolled it. I immediately thought, damn, how am I going to kind of do this without confusing Dell? Or confusing any player, not Dell personally, but I mean, 
and, and it turned out it worked beautifully as Dell just said, I got to get that codicil. It was, duh. I mean, of course he did because it makes sense. The codicil was something his Lord told him he needed to put in front of the king, right? This sealed scroll, right? Okay. Um, we also had the very first random seed. Normally I give players time to kind of stretch their legs. I mean, in media, red starts generally start in, in violence or they start in this crazy action. Well, I wanted to start them in, on the river, you know, going. And I, I tend to start a lot. I've started many sessions with, 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 uh, with parties in route on rivers. It's just great fun. I just love river stuff, right? But, um, but they rolled a three. And remember, in our random seed generator, it's weighted. So threes and 18s are, are world-threatening, or they are potentially so disastrous they could wipe out villages. They could, they could change the nature of the world. They could change the nature of the adventure right out of the gate. Well, they rolled a three. All of them rolled a one. Uh, all three of them chose to roll. I think, actually, it turned out Dell had to roll a second one. He rolled another one, so we had th a three, which was dragon attacks. Okay, so right out of the gate, I'm, I'm facing a random seed start to the session of dragon attack. I'm a, I'm, it's going to be a TPK right out of the gate. Um, well, it didn't have to be, but I mean, thinking, i, I got to fold this in. Well, I just started it with him being w awoke on the boats at, at pre-dawn by, by the roaring of this dragon coming down the river, you know, flying onto them. I didn't even give them a chance to fill themselves out. I didn't get them a chance to talk to each other. I, get, I just basically said, you're awakened by roars of some beast you've never seen or heard before. And it worked. But it, I, it, I was just, I felt like the whole session was awkward for me at first. At the start, I mean. Then it got comfortable. We were just rolling again. And some of that could be that I'm a little, uh, I was a little out of practice with this type of, um, I'll say this type I was a little out of practice, maybe. I was a little rusty. Uh, it's been a month or so since I've GM'd anything. It's been a couple of months, I think, since I've GM'd anything. So it could be, too. I was just a little bit rusty yesterday. But i got to tell you, the game is working 